Good afternoon, members, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Oliver Hart. Oliver Hart is a Nobel Memorial Prize winning economist, currently the Lewis B. and Linda L. Geiser University Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He is renowned for his work on contract theory, the theory of the firm, corporate finance, and in the fields of law and economics more generally. Professor Hart, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Molly. Um, well, it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, uh, speak at the Oxford Union. When I was growing up in the UK, uh, the thought of, of, of speaking here would have been um, rather unimaginable. Uh, but here I am. So many thanks uh, for the opportunity. So I'm going to uh, share some slides with you if I can master the... Okay. So that's even better, I hope. Um, so um, in the last few years, I have um, become interested in the topic of corporate social responsibility. And I thought that would be an appropriate thing to talk about um, at the Oxford Union. So um, that's what my slides are about. And I am, uh, let me just start by saying that my ideas in this area are based on joint work with uh, two co-authors, Eleonora Rocardo and Luigi Zingales. Um, so, uh, so corporate social responsibility is the topic. I want to start with a little bit of background. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, are economists, but um, you may be aware that um, most economists think uh, well of markets, um, a market economy. I hear you had a debate about capitalism last night and uh, capitalism won. So anyway, that would be the way economists think about things, that capitalism is, is pretty efficient, even if not always equitable. Um, but there are some circumstances where uh, the market outcome is actually not going to be efficient. And, and that's um, when um, there are externalities, when the activities of um, firms or consumers in the economy um, generate externalities. What are those? Well, an externality is something that affects people um, who you're, you're not directly dealing with. So. Um, a classic um, example of, of an externality would be pollution. So a firm produces um, output and, in the, and, and as part of that, it pollutes the environment. And that's something, the, the consequences of that are, are felt by people in the area. Um, and the, the firm is not dealing with them directly. They, these are not customers or workers. They are uh, external to any contracts. Um, the firm has entered into, and that, that's what an externality is. And um, these days, unfortunately, we face a huge externality, um, uh, carbon emissions uh, that cause uh, climate change. But, you know, there are many, it's the biggest one, but there are many other examples. Um, now, there's a broad consensus among economists that the best way to deal with externalities is through what's called a Picuvian tax that's named after the uh, famous um, British economist, Arthur Pigou. Um, so in, in the case of climate change, this would mean a carbon tax. So um, every time you emit carbon, um, you're going to uh, pay a tax. And that means you uh, internalize the damage that your activities um, are, uh, are causing. Um, so that's the idea, um, the, the economist solution to an externality like carbon emissions. But unfortunately, uh, a carbon tax is very hard to sell politically. And here we're talking about not just a tax uh, in a particular country like uh, the UK or the US, but it, it, for it to be really effective, it would have to be worldwide. And that's, that's really hard to achieve politically, even though we should be pushing, of course, for that to happen. Um, question, what to do in the meantime? Now, my view is that everyone has to do their bit, and this means companies and uh, individuals. Um, and indeed, companies or corporations are coming under increasing pressure uh, to do something about the environment, to pursue ESG goals. ESG means um, environmental, social, uh, or governance, and or governance. Um, so the pressure on companies to be socially responsible um, 
in this area and maybe in all areas, um, comes in two forms, um, exit or voice. So what do I mean these things by these things? Well, exit refers to investors divesting from dirty companies, um, carbon emitting companies, let's say, um, selling their divesting, getting out of them, selling their shares, um, or consumers uh, refusing to buy their product or workers refusing to work for them. So these are all um, examples of exit strategies. Um, in contrast, voice refers to shareholders using their voting power, their voting rights to pass ESG resolutions or vote for directors who will pursue an ESG agenda. So um, when I talk about voice, I'm, I'm referring to shareholders because they are in a unique position since they have voting rights. Other people can, of course, make noise and protest and do this kind of thing, but um, they don't have any control, uh, whereas shareholders do. Now, um, we hear a lot about exit these days. Um, uh, Harvard has announced that it's divesting from oil stocks. Um, I believe that Oxford has done the same or is in the same process. Um, we hear less about voice, shareholders using their uh, power to try to push companies in a good direction. Um, yet, um, I want to argue that voice can be powerful and in fact, more effective than ex exit. Now, because time is limited, I'm not gonna actually be able to show you that it, uh, why it's more effective than exit, although perhaps we'll get to that in the questions. But um, what I think I can do is to show you how voice can be effective. So in order to do that, I'm going to um, consider a real world example. So um, in 1984, DuPont, the um, American chemical com company, faced a choice between polluting the Ohio River with a toxic substance known as PFOA or incineration. So incineration would avoid the pollution. So that was the choice to incinerate or not to incinerate. Now, one can use uh, court case documents because eventually, uh, um, to give the game away a little bit, um, DuPont decided not to incinerate, to pollute, and eventually um, this caught up with them, although it took a very long time and, and they managed to evade um, quite a lot of the uh, the problem. But um, so um, the, the good thing is we have um, documentation coming from the, the court case. And um, one can use that to calculate the present value of the cost of incineration and the present value of the cost of not incinerating. So um, what, do I, what do I mean by present value? So I mean not just today's cost of incineration, but uh, future costs, and you discount them back and get a number uh, in uh, 1984 dollars, and that number is 19 million. So that was the cost. Uh, of course, 1984 dollars um, were worth more. So um, you know you have to multiply that by something to get to 2022 dollars. But uh, anyway, we'd. We're back in 1984, it was 19 million. The, what was the cost of, of not incinerating? Well, there was then gonna be this uh, pollution of the Ohio River and that in time led to illness and death. And uh, one can calculate the, um, the cost of that, putting some sort of value on life and, and this kind of thing. And you come up with 350 million um, in, 1984 dollars. So that was the choice, 19 versus 350. And of course, an economist would say, of course, you should um, incinerate because uh, 350, the damage from not is much bigger than the cost of, of getting rid of the mess, 19, of avoiding the mess, 19. Uh, but as I say, um, DuPont decided not to. The question I want to ask is the following. Uh, suppose this choice had been put to shareholders. It never was, DuPont management decided, made the decision. 
probably just on profit maximization grounds, but uh, suppose it had been put to the shareholders in an up or down vote. Now, I want to think of, of today's investors. So today, um, consider someone who has a half a million dollars invested in the US stock market. So that's someone who is obviously not poor by any means, but not wealthy either, somewhere in, in between. Um, such a person, if they held a diversified portfolio, so they you know, spread the half million over all the traded companies, um, they would own 10 to the minus eighth of the total US stock market and therefore of DuPont. 10 to the minus eighth is one over a hundred millionth. Okay, so imagine, as I say, imagine this is put to a vote of people like this um, and assume that people are willing to vote. Um, it makes sense for them to vote in this very simple up or down case uh, to vote the outcome they want. Um, not least because the only time the vo their vote would matter is if they're pivotal, unlikely, but that's the only time it matters. In, in that case, you obviously want the, uh, the, the, uh, your preferred outcome to um, be chosen. So, okay, this is all a long winded way of saying that um, you will vote the outcome you prefer. Okay, so let's consider it. Um, if you vote to incinerate, if that's the outcome, then um, the company's going to have to pay $19 million. That's going to um, mean a reduced dividend for you. But you own only 100 millionth of this company. So, you know, 19 million over 100 million is 19 cents. Um, so that's how much it's going to cost you personally. On the other hand, what is the, let's suppose that you are not only um, interested in your own welfare, you care a bit about everybody else. Well, who's everybody else in this case? So um, if you don't incinerate, um, then the damage, um, sorry, let me go back. Let's, let's talk about what happens if you do incinerate. So I said there's this personal loss of 19 cents, but then you, as a uh, somewhat um, socially responsible person, you care about the impact on, every, on, on, on everybody else. Okay, what is that impact? Well, there's a gain of 350 million because that's the damage that is avoided. Right, so this is a benefit of incineration that that 350 million, you know, which represented the the health problems and deaths and all that, that's avoided. But your fellow shareholders are going to have to pay the incineration cost. It's going to come out of their dividends, right? And you care you care about them. You, I mean, you care about the the people living on the by the Ohio River, but you also care about your fellow shareholders and they're going to bear um, that cost of 19 million minus, of course, the 19 cents that you're paying. But we can forget about that, right? And that's trivial. And so um, the effect on everybody else is that plus 350 minus 19, that's 331 million. So that's the social benefit from incineration. Um, and as I'm, as I was saying, you're, you're, uh, uh, let's suppose, I'm considering people who are a bit socially responsible. So you're going to put some weight on, on that. Okay. So at the end of it, then, in deciding which outcome you prefer, um, it's going to be that trade-off. If incineration is the outcome, you lose 19 cents, but society gains 331 million dollars. So what you have to ask yourself is, are you willing to give up 19 cents for a, social, a net social gain of $331 million? Well, my point, and I'm afraid I didn't, <laughs> this wasn't quite as sharp as I wanted to be, but the bottom line is, I mean, how many people would not be willing to do that? Uh, would not be willing to give up 19 cents for $331 million for everybody else? I think you would have to be a very hard-hearted uh, person not willing to make that trade-off. And so the conclusion then is that if this vote had been put to um, 
shareholders like the one I've described, the person with a half million um, dollars uh, invested in the whole market. If, if the vote had been put to people like that, uh, my view is uh, that the majority would have been willing to make that trade-off and would have therefore voted for incineration and therefore incineration would have won. Um, as uh, So actually this is the uh, pretty much the end of my talk because what I wanted to say, uh, the, the, the punchline, the thing I want you to take away is that a profit maximizing company that wasn't thinking about future lawsuits. And I think uh, DuPont at the time thought the uh, chance of a lawsuit was remote and they, did, they didn't take it too seriously. And so they were saying <clears throat> to themselves, if we incinerate, that's $19 million out of the corporate coffers. Um, we're, we believe in profit maximization. We don't want to do it. They weren't looking at the effect on everybody else. But um, so that's what profit maximization leads to, a socially incorrect decision. In contrast, if the decision was put to the shareholders, then um, I think, you know, they would have each been saying 19 cents. Are we willing to give that up for this huge social gain of $331 million? I think the majority would have said yes. And so the vote would have gone the other way in favor of incineration. All this is to say then, oh, I think that is, okay. That is the end of the talk. So let me just summarize by saying, and I can get rid of my slides. Let me summarize. Uh, the bottom line is that, sh that shareholder engagement can lead to very good outcomes. So in my example, it actually led to the socially efficient outcome to in incinerate. And therefore, company, you know, if we if we allow shareholders to express their voice, this can actually push companies in a good direction. Um, so let's have more of more more voice. That's that's the uh, um, the takeaway. Back to you, Molly. Thank you, Professor. And I want to take the time to remind our audience members that you are welcome to leave questions in a Zoom question function at the bottom of your screens. It makes perfect sense when you explain it um, like that, but how do you think we incentivize companies to listen to their shareholders more often? Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. And I think what I would say is that um, two things. First of all, some of this um, voice, it's um, shareholders can pressure companies to listen to them, even if companies don't wanna do it. And that is happening. Um, it can happen through shareholder resolutions. Now in the US, uh, this is a difference between the US and the UK. Um, in the US, uh, shareholder resolutions are not binding. So actually management could still ignore them. You know, even if uh, an ESG resolution passes and, um, and not many of them do, but they are beginning more are now getting a majority. Um, management can ignore them, but they might, decide that's not a very smart move. And so that's one thing shareholders can do. Another thing shareholders can do is to elect uh, to the board people with um, you know, the appropriate preferences who are gonna pursue an ESG agenda. And that has happened uh, famously with a hedge fund called Engine Number no. One. Um, just a few months ago, they were able to get three of their um, chosen people on the board of Exxon Mobil. Um, even though they had an extremely small <coughs> stake, excuse me, they persuaded other investors to support them. And so this, this was a kind of um, a punch in the face to the Exxon Mobile management because they, they resisted this, but in fact, these people won. And so they're on the board now. So, you know, okay, so the, you don't have to have management wanting to do it. But at the same time, I think in the, uh, you know, if, if enough noise is made, managers will realize perhaps that um, this is the right thing for them to do. So I don't think board members, um, you know, sometimes they actually want to do the right thing. And we're living in a world where humans are fighting against a battle sort of against themselves to prevent climate change. And many pin the blame for this on 
multinational corporations almost exclusively citing these issues of incentives in your view is that accusation fair do you think that corporations are entirely to blame um no i wouldn't first of all i think multinationals can sometimes um be part of the solution because um to the extent that they are kind of look operating across countries um they can actually be more effective in um doing something about carbon emissions globally or in at least in large parts of the world than any single government so you know i, I think i mentioned in one of my early early slides that uh you, the carbon tax you really need it to be universal which means coordination by governments which is very hard to do um, multinationals because they cross countries can actually pick up some of the slack um I think we're all to blame, uh, a lot of people, including economists, but others, um, for uh, kind of pushing this view that the right thing for companies to do is to maximize profit. It's not only what they do, but it's even the right thing to do. This is what Milton Friedman famously argued 50 years ago. And, um, you know, I think his argument was wrong. I mean, basically, he argued that um, management's meant to act on behalf of shareholders. And shareholders want more money. And even if they're selfish, uh, sorry, even if they're not selfish, um, they can always use that extra money to do socially good things. That's the right, uh, that's how we should organize things. We shouldn't have companies doing socially good things. We should just um, have individuals do it and governments. Um, I think that, argu that argument is wrong. And in fact, my example shows why it's wrong because this is a case where DuPont was in a unique position to incinerate and that's not something shareholders could have done themselves and I think socially responsible shareholders uh, would have as my example shows would have said to DuPont please incinerate um, but we but the, the Friedman sort of idea uh, even though it's wrong has uh, you know one has, has been the dominant view for the last 50 years. So companies have been able to say, look, we want to make money and people tell us it's the right thing to do. So it's now if we tell them it's not the right thing to do, I think they can perhaps uh, behave in a different way. And in recent years, corporate social responsibility and the idea of uh, companies being socially responsible as well as profitable has become more popular, sort of a buzzword, if you will. Given your work on the principal agent problem, how do you think firms should reconcile the social responsibility with this idea that shareholders may buy and sell their shares very quickly and only demand short term profitability? Well, um, let me say two, two things in response. First of all, again, I'm going back to uh, going back to the example. I think the example shows, I mean, whether you're short term or long term, um, if you're asked, will you give up 19 cents for $331 million? I think most people would say yes, which su suggests that actually, you know, shareholders are not evil or, or, or uh, totally you know, monomaniacal people just want short term money. No, they, they're, you know, they're people. They're you and me. And um, we're all, you know, most of us somewhat decent. So I think asking them what they want is is actually can lead to to good outcomes not bad ones that's um the first thing the second thing is you sort of hinted at the beginning of your question i, I you said something which which made me think the following a lot of people argue um that it's win-win that you can be social that being socially responsible is actually good for profit um indeed that's you know a lot of business people now say this um, I think this is, uh, you know, if, if it was that way, then the battle to make companies more socially responsible would be very simple because man managers could just continue with this idea that their job is to make as much money as possible. And now they would just realize that being socially responsible is just going to make that even better, you know. But the trouble is, it just, it couldn't, or, I mean, that's, that's true sometimes, but it cannot possibly be true always. Again, back to the DuPont example, doing the right thing 
meant paying a cost. It's not win-win. It was a trade-off uh, situation. And that's something we have to recognize. A lot of people refuse to accept it. And in 2016, you won your Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science alongside um, Harvard professor Bengt Holstrom for your work on contract theory and discussing sort of increasingly relevant issues of CEO pay. Your colleague argued that CEO bonuses are too high, causing them to take reckless risks um, and that the basic salaries should be prioritised. But given that the median FTSE 100 CEO was paid over £2.5 million in 2020, 86 times the median wage, why does it matter that bonuses are slightly cut when they are already being paid such a high amount? Okay, um, it's a pity we can't have my fellow laureate here to answer the question. Uh, by the way, he's he, he was he's at MIT, not Harvard. Ah. And they'd be very upset to, <laughs> at the thought. Uh, we would welcome him, but with um, so the. Uh, can you just say again what he said, just to his, his um, the quote you had, the bonuses were too high. Yes. And that led to reckless. Risks. And that basic salary should instead be prioritized. I see. Is that what he said? Well, okay, good for him. Uh, <laughs> what would I say? I would say that um, by bonuses, I think he means, uh, well, it, it's also, you know, shares or, or stock options, these would all um, make, they would be what we call, what economists call high powered incentives. So you have a big incentive to, to increase profit. I don't think that necessarily um, encourages you to, to take risks actually, um, but it, um, I think what <laughs> my concern actually would be more that, um, very high powered incentives can encourage people to um, shade on quality or, or safety. Um, I've just uh, read a book called Flying Blind. I don't know whether you know this. It's about Boeing and what led to the terrible crashes, you know, which, which killed a lot of people. And it was, um, you know, they, they had this new plane with, a, with complicated uh, mechanisms in it and, um, um, I think either something went wrong with them, with them, or the pilots didn't know how to operate them. And the question was, you know, who should have trained them or provided the training manuals? And I think the the, the bottom line of the book is that there's there's a lot of fault at Boeing, and it came from a cost cutting culture. So people were incentivized. Um, this was a shift. Um, it didn't used to be that way in Boeing, but then there was a, a, a shift and people were um, rewarded for cutting costs, which is the sort of bonus issue. So I think that can definitely um, have uh, negative consequences. In fact, Banked, uh, my fellow laureate, is, you know, has written, a, wrote a famous article on this, on exactly the sort of thing I'm talking about, that if you have um, too high powered incentives on one dimension, you're gonna cut activities on an actions on another, in this case, safety. Um, so I think that uh, one, one really has to take account of that. And sometimes it is indeed better to have um, something closer to a fixed salary. And I think the same would be true now if we consider what I've been talking about today. If we think that things like, um, um, you, you know, environmental harm are important and we want to try to reduce it, then having managers highly incentivized to make money is going to uh, go against that and so that's another reason to to cut back on on these high on the, on the bonuses and moving on to your own work you give the example of the failure of private contracts in the u.s prison system which caused a deterioration of quality as private firms said to incentive yes. that cost um in the prison system how can you be sure that a government alternative doesn't lead to the sort of off-site and it, off-cited extreme inefficiencies in its operation. Do you think that governments can develop and deliver better prison systems? Um, well, actually that was a good segue because it is, it's the same um, issue about, uh, it's not quite the same, but it's very close um, the, to the idea that, you know, in a private prison um, 
says, uh, if private companies run prisons, um, they're going to be putting a lot of weight on profit and cutting back on safety and not training guards properly or hiring guards who are not don't have the right skills. This is what we argued in our um, paper. Um, under government operation, um, we would expect, uh, and, and we, we go into this in more detail, but um, basically people are going to be more on, on, on um, just flat wages, flat fixed salaries, and that's going to give them less incentive to um, under trained guards and, and this kind of thing. And this is the trade-off. Um, so, I mean, one response to what you said is that actually having sort of inefficient government can sometimes be a good thing because yes, the inefficiency is unfortunate, but at least they're not um, pushing very hard on you know one thing, which might have bad consequences for other things. So, um, yes, sometimes sort of laziness uh, may be uh, second best optimal. Um, but I also think, um, I mean, we can try to do something about government inefficiency. We can also. I think try to write better contracts with private providers. So um, you know there are there are alternative. Uh, one, one thing you would do is you could um, have a non-profit private company run a prison. Um, you know a bit like uh, you know non-profit schools, Eton or Oxford for that matter, um, it can be thought of as a non-profit um, institution, and those. Um, you know, and if, if you had a nonprofit company running a prison, um, their incentive to cut costs would also be low. And so you might be able to solve the, the problem that way and perhaps not have the sort of inefficiency you're talking about. Um, th this, this is, by the way, wasn't in our paper, but it's part of my more recent thinking. Well, it's very relevant to the conversations that are happening now. Um, receiving a Nobel Prize is one of the greatest honors that economists can achieve. What was that experience like for you? Um, and how do you hope to inspire other economists? <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful experience, I have to say. I mean, um, it was, you know, incredibly exciting to re receive the phone call at 5.02 a.m. Um, and, uh, you know, the world changed for me. You wouldn't have invited me to speak at the Oxford Union without, you, know, you see, in order to, in, in order to fulfill my, my childhood dream, I had to win the Nobel Prize and in order to be invited to the Oxford Union. So um, it, it, it changed my life, um, at, mo mostly in a very positive way. Um, there are some negatives. Um, actually, you do spend quite a lot of time um, thinking about whether you deserved it. <laughs> I, I have, I have. Um, so, you know, there can be some, some stress, but um, on the whole, it's been wonderful. And you are, what does, you asked me how I would inspire economists. I, I don't really think I, I can be that inspirational, frankly. Um, if they, you know, I would like to think they would be interested in the work and um, carry it forward, but uh, we'll see. Well, I have some more questions on your work for, for those who may well be inspired at listening today. Um, you've previously spoken about control rights and how they're fundamental in contract theory. Um, would you be able to give a brief, um, I suppose, overview of, of control rights and following on from that, do you think the lack of awareness about their impact means that more exploitation occurs? Um, okay, the first, so, examples um well we can uh, let me give two qu quick as examples i mean the basic idea is that uh, in a situation uh, where um contracts are incomplete so they laugh they leave stuff out which is pretty much always um there's going to be some some discretion left over and 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 who has the right to make those discretionary uh, decisions matters. So an example, let's let's go back to prisons since we've talked about that. Um, if, if some situation arose in a prison um, uh, or, uh, and um, there was some discretion involved, so it might be um, 
one example would be hiring the next round of guards. Let's let's make it very simple, because um, we talked about that. Um, so you know, who gets to do that? Um, absent uh, now, there could be some provision in the contract about how that that how that happens. Um, but absent that, it would be. Um, the owner, you know, whoever owns the company running the prison, who would make that decision. So um, if it's a private company, um, then the private provider would have a lot of discretion about um, how to do this round of hiring. And um, if it was uh, government owned, then um, the, the warden or whoever is acting on, on behalf of the government would have that discretion. So um, we argue that it makes a difference because um, if the government controls that decision, uh, they can make sure that um, inappropriate guards are not hired. Um, so uh, uh, another example, which uh, so the the questioner um, suggested that people don't know about this very much. But if you take, um, so my next example is one where they certainly do. Um, founders of, of startups, so suppose, uh, and who knows, some of you may be, um, you, have a, you have an idea, and how do you finance it? Well, uh, um, often uh, through venture capitalists. Um, so um, you, you, you have a, a contract, and uh, people spend a lot of time Talking, uh, the thing they that first comes to their mind with that contract is how are the financial rewards going to be divided up between the founder and the um, investors? Um, but uh, and, and this is stressed in 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 TV shows on these things. But um, there's another part of it, the contract which is very important and people recognise to be important, and that's the allocation of control rights between the, the, the two groups, the founder, the group on the one hand and the investors on the other. So um, this boils down to, for example, um, who's gonna be on the board? Um, how many, how many um, people on the board will the founder be able to choose and how many people will the investors choose? And maybe they'll have some people who are independent to sort of round things out. Um, so, why does that matter? Because decisions that have to be made about this uh, company, you know, all the time and for years uh, going forward. And the question is, who's going to make those decisions? Who, for example, is going to decide um, whether the, let's say, the founder is the CEO um, at the beginning, but at some point later on, maybe um, some of the people think that he or she should be replaced. Who gets to make that decision? Who has the majority on the board? Um, the, that's an important, I think, a, a, a very real world example of, of um, control and how it matters. Um, now, the last bit was about exploitation. That bit I'm not quite uh, sure uh, about, but let me just say it is certainly possible that um, you, know, you join a firm and at some point um, the firm instructs you to do something and you may not realize that they could really do that. Of course, you always have, um, maybe if you'd known that, you would have not uh, taken that job. At the same time, of course, you can always quit. So in a way, that kind of authority is a bit limited. But if your um, alternative prospects are not good, then maybe um, quitting is, is very unattractive. And so you're sort of somewhat locked in and then their ability to tell you what to do might be more than you you understood going in. And we've spoken about climate change, spoken about prison reform. Do you find yourself drawn to areas of economics which reflect the wider political conversations that we're having at the moment? Or has that been a sort of happy accident? That's a very good question. Um, and my the answer is very simple. It's been pretty much a happy accident uh, for me. Uh, or, or perhaps another way to say it is it's been a sort of evolution because um, I started off very much as um, an economic theorist, um, and uh, you know, to be honest, I I knew very little about reality, <laughs> and um, 
Yes, and it was challenging. Uh, some sort of facts were quite challenging for me. Um, I did my first degree as a, uh, in mathematics. So I was always somewhat of an abstract thinker. And when I moved into economics, it was the abstract parts of it that appealed to me. And it's only over time that I've um, A, become a bit more worldly and B, um, seen how some of um, my ideas can be applied and also realized the importance of, of, of uh, starting with, with new work. I mean, with existing theory, you, you, don't, you can just take what other people have done and extend it in, in way, various ways. You don't know, really have to know that much about the world, how the world works. Um, but if you tr want to do something new, um, then it's, I, I, I realized that often the best way is to think of some phenomenon out there um, in the world that isn't well understood and tried to develop a theory to explain that. And in, so that's what I moved to, to doing. And for that, um, you need to be more connected to the world. Well, I'm keen to make time for some audience questions. Our first one is from Oscar Wazalek from St. Hughes. He asked, do you believe institutions should exist for calculating externalities? Um, well, we do have, um, I'm not quite sure what that, I mean, governments calculate externalities sometimes, uh, and we also have um, people in universities uh, calculate the costs of climate change and come up with um, numbers about the appropriate carbon tax, you know, what, what, what should the tax be? be? Um, and I mean, the estimates differ widely. That's one of the things you'll have, you know, one academic saying this, one academic saying something else, um, an institute, we have um, various uh, private institutions, then we have, um, you know, you have something like the Stern Report, if you remember that, which was um, Nick Stern produced, and, but under the uh, auspices of the UK government, um, and that had lots of numbers in it. So I, I think there's a, there, there are lots of um, places that can do it. And of course, businesses also do it, but um, there one might be a little more suspicious of their um, motives. And we have an anonymous question who says, good afternoon, if you look at the agro-industrial sector from an economic point of view, can you see the, that the agro-industrial sector is becoming more environmentally friendly and more responsible? If not, do you think that that's because it's impossible because the industry is not ready yet? Um, so I, I think, um, I, I think there are uh, signs that at least there's pressure on companies to be more uh, responsible. Um, uh, so, but of course, some of it is, you know, is is sort of window dressing, and we have to be careful. So, I, I don't. Um, I think the consensus would be that there's been at least some movement in a in a good direction. Um, but I think um, the question is. Uh, is it going to continue? Um, I have a. I mean, I think there's uh, there good there are reasons to think it will because I think that um, first people are more you know are more aware of climate change and the dangers, and so they're getting worried about it. They're seeing that governments aren't um, doing what they should. By the way, I mean, let me make it clear. I government the government role uh, the role of governments in this is very important. But I'm talking about, you know, given that they're not doing a perfect job, uh, we have to do things as well. And that involves putting pressure on companies. And I think people are waking up to this. And so there's going to be more pressure. And then um, there's also people who say, oh, young people, people like you, <laughs> are more socially responsible than uh, older people. And so the, you know, the, the millennials and younger are going to be um, that's they, they're going to uh, create a different culture and, and, and um, they, they are going to want companies to even the one you know the ones they own when they eventually own them to behave better so given that I think the pressure is going to continue I'm fairly optimistic the thing I'm um, 
most concerned about is this win-win thing. So um, a lot of business people are, are saying, yes, yes, uh, we're all in favor of ESG because it's good for the bottom line. But once it becomes apparent that that is not always the case, and sometimes it's bad for the bottom line, um, are they um, going to now then sort of find some reason to turn against it and, um, and somehow win the day? And the status quo will be preserved. I hope not, but that is a little, uh, you know, something I worry about a bit. And Rachel asks, one of the things you're best known for is developing theories on incomplete contracts. What impact do you think these theories have on our institutions and how they should be governed? A wonderful question. Um, if only I wish I had some one, uh, great answers about, oh, you know, we've completely changed this and, and, and this works so much better now um, because of my work. I, I fear um, it's not, I, I, I don't have those success stories. Um, I think the work that I have done and others have done in this area on incomplete contracts um, is helpful mainly as a kind of way of thinking about things. So, um, you know, when it comes to uh, public versus private ownership of prisons, say, um, a lot of people would instinctive, instinctively think this is some sort of moral question or, uh, you know, the whole like, private is terrible in the case of prisons. How could you possibly think about that? Um, as opposed to thinking of it uh, as an economic, an economic question, um, what, how to get the best outcome. Um, and you know the private sector is capable of doing many good things. We see it all the time. Um, so I think, but but my work in this area doesn't uh, tell you it should always be private or always public. It tells you it depends on the circumstances. And in in, uh, in the paper, um, my co-authors and I talk about different. Uh, types of services. So, you know, you've got prisons, what about hospitals? What about schools? What about um, the army? <laughs> um, you know, what should be private? What should be, be public? And we apply our theory, um, but it's more art than science. And, and in the case of prisons, we argue that um, the highest security ones should be public, but some of the other ones uh, could be uh, private. But I think if you know, you, if, if you were considering a particular situation, there would be no formula to tell you, but I think the framework would be useful, the kinds of things to be thinking about, whether the quality issues are particularly important uh, in this context, uh, maybe yes, maybe in that context, no. Um, so it's all qualitative. I, I'm not sure that was quite an answer to the question, but <laughs> it's an answer to some question. And Beatrice asks, do you think that companies caring about their impact is just a trend that makes them look good? Or do you, new departments focused on sustainability actually have an impact? Well, um, that's, uh, yes, let me, it, we sort of covered some of that. I think that, um, I think for it to work, uh, it's the pressure has to continue from uh, shareholders and others. In other words, I think if you just left it to CEOs, um, uh, they they might well um, abandon it as soon as uh, it was a question of, of reducing profit, of, of incurring extra costs, because, you know, the more money they have um, coming out of the company, the more um, they get. <laughs> it, I think um, people like to have more resources rather than um, less. And so um, I think the pressure's got to come up from outside. But I think, uh, so that's up to us. Um, shareholders of whom you are either already or you will be soon. And Chloe asks, smart contracts have evolved and become more used in the last few years. What are your views on them and how do you think they can ever work in the long term? Uh, good question. Um, so I have a bit of prob a, a, a problem with smart contracts because they're based, uh, as I understand it, on, I mean, it's blockchain and Bitcoin, and there's Bitcoin at the at the bottom of it all. And like many economists, I'm a big skeptic on Bitcoin because it seems to me it, it, it's, it's a bubble and it should burst. Now, uh, it's taking quite a long time to do so, and maybe we'll all be proved wrong, but um, 
I don't really like a system that is based on something as flimsy as that. Um, however, there are elements of um, blockchain and smart contracts which are appealing because certain things can be automated and um, uh, so that, um, I mean, I, an example um, that I think is, is real, realistic would be, um, um, you know, if you want to get insurance against your uh, flight being delayed. Um, and uh, so, you know, in the old days, you would have to, let's suppose your flight was delayed, you'd have to document that and, and, and you know, show, prove to the insurance company that it really was delayed and it would all be quite, you know, take a long time. And um, with blockchain, the thing can be automated so that, um, you know, the flight time is automatically relayed to um, the insurance company or whoever. And then Bitcoin is, unfortunately, is automatically transferred from the insurance company to you and all, all the, the paperwork uh, is avoided. And delay and delays. So um, you know that's good. I can I can see the the benefits of that. Um, is that an answer? I'm, I, let me just say though uh, one thing. I don't think of smart contracts as being a solution uh, to that many problems, but in particular, the kind of things I'm particularly interested in in my work, particularly in my recent work, is uh, long-term contractual relationships, um, which are relationships where we, we um, work together over many years, and, and the question is, can we develop a good relationship or, or not? I don't think uh, smart contracts are going to help that situation at all. That's a good answer, in my opinion, and it's a good good place to leave our questions. I'd like to finish with one question that we've asked every speaker this term. If you could give our audience one thought to take away with them this week, what would that be? This a thought to take away with them? Just, just something to leave them with, I suppose. But not about the talk per se. Up to you. Um, oh. <laughs> How many minutes do I have? Um, well, you're not. Um, democratic institutions are very important. <laughs> I think um, I'm waiting to see whether the American de democratic system will continue to, to work. I, uh, you're not in America, um, but I hope as young people you will uh, push uh, to make sure that, that democratic institutions um, uh, stay strong. Well, thank you. <laughs> Serious thought, I'm afraid. Yeah, Saha, it's been an honour to have you this evening, and uh, um, thank you very much to all of our audience members for joining us. I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, bye everybody.